For this next conversation, I'm really excited uh, that we have the opportunity to hear from Brad Smith and Jim Lowry. Now, it's going to be a little bit different than some of our other conversations, and I want to set the scene a little. So I want you to pretend like you're in a coffee shop. Remember when we could go to those and hang out? And in the corner, you see Brad Smith and Jim Lowry having a conversation, and you get the opportunity to just eavesdrop on what they're talking about. So I'm going to set the two of you up for this conversation, and we get to have this exclusive opportunity to hear you discuss what business leaders and leadership is looking like on the front lines of confronting injustice and racism. So to start it, my question to both of you is, what is different about 2020 and recent public injustices that are putting pressure on corporates to take a stand against racial inequality? Okay. Well, obviously, I think it's a really important question. What is different about the year 2020 in America when it comes to the issues around racism? You know, in some ways, I would say the answer is nothing. And in other ways, I would say the answer is everything. First of all, obviously, the biggest mistake we could make, I think, is to believe that we've discovered something that has just started happening in our country. This, the year 2020 is really the, the first year of the fifth century of racism in America. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, the problems that have been cast in bold relief are issues of longstanding, including the issues around violence to black the issues around discrimination, you know, really the issues around the systemic basis for uh, these problems. But at the same time, I do think that something quite important has happened. I think people's eyes have been opened anew. Uh, I don't think we should ever think that this is the first time we've opened our eyes to these problems. Uh, I remember very clearly in 2015 and in 2016, just four and five years ago, when the nation reacted with alarm about violence being inflicted on other black citizens, sometimes by police officers. I think we should remember the issues of the 1960s and a year like 1968. But I do think that we are in a renewed reawakening of concern and a and renewed sense of energy and even impatience among more people about doing something about this problem. I think we should recognize that the technology of our time, namely the cameras that we all carry around in our smartphones, are making it far more difficult for attacks to take place with impunity. All of this, I think, is a foundation for more progress. I think that the younger people in this country who are voicing extraordinary impatience are really providing a voice that we need to hear and we need to heed. So I hope that out of all of this, we will move forward, make far more progress, see if we cannot change the culture of this country. Uh, I think it would be a grave mistake for us to think that a problem that has persisted for four centuries can be ended in four months. We must remain determined and we must remain persistent, but impatience can do us a world of good. Well, I've answered the question. I'm, I don't know whether Jim can hear me. I think they're working. I'm happy to. I, I, okay. Yeah. I, you know, I'll just, I'll expand a little bit while we're working on our technical challenges. Hopefully it's not because of Microsoft software, I have to add. Um, this is a year that I think speaks to more segments of American society in a different way. And I think that is important and constructive as well. Uh, I don't think in the 1960s or even in 2015 or 2016 there, is, there was the focus that there is today on what companies can and should do, on what the business community can and should do. And this has sparked a broad conversation I'm finding across the business community in the country, and I know we'll have a chance, I think, to talk more about this. I think that's a good thing as well. I think the fundamental question, frankly, is the same for all of us. What can we each do? Uh, but I think that the, the bar has been raised in terms of expectations on business and on companies. And 
I, I think that will do us all some good. Thanks so much, Brad. You know, uh, and, and I apologize. We are having a little bit of uh, difficulty getting Jim back on the line. So we're going to give it one more shot. Uh, and while we do, you know, one of my questions to you is, what has this looked like to Microsoft in the past few months? Um, and what does it kind of look like on the horizon? Have there been any changes? Have there been any uh, things going on at Microsoft that you can discuss that that has come about because of these recent things going on? Well, I think we, like many companies, have stepped back and asked ourselves, what more can we do? What more should we do? And the answer, in short, is we can and should do a lot. Um, you know, we've really focused on a three-part initiative, and I have found it you know, especially helpful to get feedback and listen to different groups of our employees, often, of course, our African-American and Black employees, about what they want to see us do. Um, one thing that people want to see is they want to see companies do a better job with the things that we control ourselves, namely our own representation of our employees, our managers, our senior leaders, and the like. Uh, and yeah, I hear from some employees who say, I don't think that a company can solve the problems of the nation or the world, but I sure as heck know that you can do a better job yourself. So we've committed, for example, in the next five years to double representation for African Americans and Blacks among our managerial ranks, among our leadership ranks, and the like. Uh, we're spending $150 million over these five years to invest in stronger recruiting and development and retention programs to really advance diverse representation. Uh, the second thing that we've concluded is that we can have an enormously bigger impact if we think not only about ourselves, but the business ecosystem of which we are a part. And every company is part of an ecosystem, and by definition, a bigger company it plays uh, a bigger role. We have many suppliers. Um, we've announced, for example, a, a, an initiative to spend more than $500 million in additional procurement from firms that are owned by minorities in the United States. Uh, we've announced an initiative uh, that will look at our top 100 suppliers um, that mostly are not owned by minorities today, but we'll ask them to report on diverse representation in their ranks. Um, this is something that I've learned a lot myself from working with law firms over the last decade, where we were really the first company to create a law firm diversity program where we pay an additional 2% bonus per year to law firms that reach and meet or surpass certain diversity goals. So I think for all of us, especially that have a larger footprint in the economy, um, we can extend beyond ourselves in terms of how we work with our suppliers and vendors. And then the final piece that we're focused on is our impact in society more broadly. We had to ask ourselves, what is it that we believe we uniquely can do well? And I think that's a question every company can ask. It, it sort of takes you back to the industry that you're in, the mission you've defined for yourself. Um, we've uh, expanded an existing initiative around justice and justice reform. And we've committed $50 million over the next five years to really seek to harness the power of data to create more transparency in communities around the country and thereby empower populations. Well, thanks so much, Brad. You know, I, I think we're, we're so unable to get Jeff, Jim back on the line. I think we're just a microcosm of what anybody can do. Um, let me say just yeah. thank you for having me. But more importantly, thank you for the opportunity that I believe we all have to work more together on this. Well, thank you so much, Brad, for your time today.